Welcome to Inside the Arena, your source for everything off the ice, off the court and outside the field of play. With your hosts, Como Sports Director Nico Tamurian and Como Senior Reporter Chris Daniels. Wow, the crowd's going wild, Nico. It gets me every time. <laughs> All the people outside watching us. Chris, I've heard that 19 times, and it makes me laugh every single time. 19 times. 19 <laughs> weeks? Here we are. Wow. Inside the arena. We love it. Inside the studio. Yeah, what we were we were inside Climate Pledge for the first time for the Kraken for the first time in six months. How cool is that? I mean, a lot of cool things going on. We're going to be back for basketball, and it's just an awesome time. It's a uh, it's a big week over at the at the old barn. Can yeah. we call it the old barn yet? The old barn that was renovated. I don't. As it's now into year four, can you believe it already? Four Crazy. years. They're starting the fourth year at Climate Pledge that opened up in twenty twenty one, and yeah, it's a brand new building. Do we need to say this? Anymore, it's the old roof with a brand new building. How did they pull that off? I that you know, listen, we obviously love that facility, but that is when you think about it, really, really crazy. When you look around, whether you're at a concert, a game, or a WWE wrestling show, even like you look and you're like, this is incredible, and it's hard to believe that it was, you know, done the way it was, keeping the roof, but just making everything else inside save the art. You know, somebody should do a documentary on that. Oh, I don't know. Who are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I've got some ideas. Well, we're going to talk about the NHL, the NBA, uh, another big week uh, as as the NBA is coming back for one night only for the third year in a row at Climate Pledge Arena with the Rain City Classic. But first, before we get to all of that, this is something we like to do every week. We like to talk about what's good and bad in the world of sports business, what's going on off the ice, off the court, off the field of play. It's what we call four quarters. All right, so Nico, you always take us to first on this. <laughs> and, and and by the way, uh, we're going to talk a lot about the NBA as we mm -hmm. continue on with this show. Kevin Calabro, you talk to him. A lot Aww. of people love Kevin in the greater Seattle area as the longtime play-by-play -play guy with the Sonics. He is now with the Blazers. He's going to talk about uh, the the big event at Climate Pledge Arena and the Rain City Classic. That's that's good. But but you always kick us off every yeah, week. Yeah, and, and, and I've got one for you here. And it and it might sound a little more X's nose, but I'm going to explain to you why this is my positivity going to first base of the four corners. Jordan Eberle is the Kraken captain, and it's the first time they've had a captain since they traded Mark Giordano in the middle of that inaugural season. So why does that matter in the world of sports business? Well. The captain is more than that guy who goes and fights the other team when there's a cheap shot, right? Uh, this is somebody who's going to represent that franchise in our community. And we know the Kraken does a lot in this community, and I can't think of a better person. There's a lot of cool guys on that team. I mean, you could you could have said Jared McCann. You could have said Adam Larson, Vince Dunn, Yanni Gord, all as captain, and I think people would have accepted it. And I think that speaks volumes of Jordan Eberle, the guy he is, the representative of our city and that franchise he is. And, and that's why I love this as my first corner, because um, he is that now. He is that guy, the face of the franchise, so to speak, um, that is going to represent our city on that NHL stage. And this had been debated for a long time. Yeah. Should they have a captain? Should they wait another year? They were the only franchise without a captain. This signifies, again, another step for that franchise to add Jordan Eberle as the second captain all time. All time. Four seasons, two captains. And speaking of the uh, the Kraken, Jessica Campbell made history well, this uh, week. We love it. As well, uh, she garnered the, the biggest cheers on opening night as the first female assistant coach in NHL history. She uh, worked with Dan Bilesman down in Coachella Valley. She's been well-respected in Coachella Valley and in, in working with the young players that are now like Shane Wright, part of the franchise and part of the uh, Kraken, so we will continue to follow that. But it was a big moment, as you saw on opening night or opening afternoon. That sounds weird. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. You know, one thing I love about Jessica is, you know, they interviewed her at intermission. They're like, oh, my God, what about this? And she obviously understands the gravity and what it means to a lot of people. She's like, well, I've done this a lot. Like, just because it's the, this historic milestone, she's also coached a lot of meaningful games. And I love that she has that business approach, but at the same time does understand that this means a lot, of course, to her, but to 
millions perhaps out there watching. And, and I will continue on with the new job front. Okay. And, yeah. and good news uh, this week over at the Seattle Mariners. We can talk about what happened on the field uh, this year, maybe not being so great, but what is great, uh, long overdue, Kevin Martinez yeah. uh, has been named the president of business operations. He's on the same level as Jerry Depoto in terms of the franchise hierarchy. He reports directly to John Stanton, named the president of business operations. This is the role that was vacated by Katie Griggs. Uh, Kevin has been there for th- more what more than three decades now. 34 years. Uh, working behind the scenes. He is a marketing extraordinaire. He's the guy who helped craft all those commercials that everybody loves that they now watch on YouTube. A lot of the ideas for game day marketing have come from him. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people internally over at the Seattle Mariners that I've talked to uh, that are happy that Kevin Martinez is now there as the president of the Seattle Mariners. Uh, full disclosure, we're not alone in saying this. You and I love Kevin Martinez. He's just a great guy. In addition to an awesome business executive, he's that guy that you get excited when you see, you want to talk to him. And um, yeah, but the funny thing is, like I say that you and I, like he's like that with a lot of people. Yeah. That's just the great dude that he is. So uh, couldn't be happier. Awesome news. Well, what don't you like this week? I've got a couple here. Uh, and I'll oh, make boy. It- you're gonna, I go got to, two. you're gonna go to third and fourth. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna round third, think about going for home, and then go back. Okay. Okay. So first thing I'm gonna make this one quick is um the fact that we mentioned a minute ago the Kraken had to play at one o'clock. I understand that uh hockey is that sport looking for a little more exposure of the big four anyway, right? Yeah. And so you kind of just take what the network ESPN can give you, and it's cool that they're on ESPN. No, all great things. But couldn't you have found like an East Coast game to be at that time? Like you know, you and, and kudos to the Kraken fans for showing up seventeen thousand plus the announced attendance for a, a game during work and school on a Tuesday. Yeah, um, I just kind of lament that it was at one o'clock in the afternoon. I thought that could have been planned better. Couldn't you have made an East Coast game that? Because weren't weren't they worried about this inside the arena? That didn't happen. It didn't happen. It was a great, but that that is a legitimate concern when you're talking yeah. about that. The other thing is, and this I'll keep this one quick as well. I don't want to go into all the details on it, but there was a video circulating on social media from the Huskies' big win over Michigan over the weekend. And if you saw this, a Wolverines assistant coach, yes. their director of high school relations, runs over with some curse words at a Husky fan. Now, listen, fans can be idiots. Yeah. I love fans, but they can be idiots sometimes. But if you're the person on the field, whether it's in a very tiny role like as a reporter or whether you're representing your school or your team, you ignore those people. I don't care what they say. They can say the most hurtful things. You have to understand they're idiots. And you also have to understand there's cell phones everywhere. Well, that's the other part of it, right? That whatever you do, he could have been 1 million percent justified. Like what the fan said could have been some of the most horrific things. We don't, I don't know. Yeah. That's not on the video, probably by design. right? Right. But you also can't justify it by reacting to it. You have to be the bigger person, which you already are until you stoop to that level. So I, I didn't, why would you do that? You got to know better. You got to know better. Hey, you already took us home, but I'm just going to throw out one more thing as we uh, close four corners. Uh, There was a development this week with a preliminary approval for the House case. This is the one involving uh, the NCAA and revenue sharing for student athletes. Uh, It it just feels like this is turning into the Wild West for uh, college athletics, for college sports, particularly college football. This is now becoming, uh, as this advances, and and there are some pros to revenue sharing with student athletes, there is no control right now. Uh, When this goes into effect and there is revenue sharing, there will be uh, likely a salary cap, so to speak, and there will be student athletes being treated as employees. But there is a a negative side. It certainly feels like the the way this is going with college athletics, with NIL, we're just going to see folks that – and student athletes that are not showing up to class anymore yeah, that are yeah, just yeah. essentially showing up for the biggest dollar to play minor league sports on a college level. And I, I think that, uh, yes, one can argue this is potentially a step in the right direction and that a lot of these former student athletes, former players will get some money. Uh, but boy, it certainly seems like, uh, it, it is continuing to be the wild west. Well, at this point, just take away the facade of student athlete at that point, right? Like, right. let's just call it what it is. Happy that athletes can get paid. They deserve that. They deserve NAL. But at some point, it needs to. we need to have a conscious and, and regular decision here. Well, let's talk about something we, we consciously talk about every week. See what I did there? See what I did there? 
<laughs> All right. The supersonic minute, something we like to talk about every week to give an update on what's going on. Uh, there's not a lot to report that's different from last week when we joined you. I just wanted to share this little fun nugget yes. uh, from the Seattle Chamber of Commerce. They they do this index uh, that they really like to get a voter sampling every few months of where uh, people how people feel the city is going and uh, just kind of a status check. And they've done this since 2021. And and we won't talk about a lot of the issues that they included in this. But funny enough, they, they had a, a question to people about long-term priorities in the city of Seattle. And things like light rail to West Seattle and Ballard and funding for small businesses around big events like the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, National Hockey League's Winter Classic, the, the FIFA World Cup. But they actually had a question in here about long-term priorities for the city of Seattle, investing in the continued revitalization of Seattle Center by bringing back the Sonics mm. and redoing Memorial Stadium used by high school sports teams, making it easier to get from Seattle Center to the new waterfront. You know, 56% of people that they polled in a, in a poll of 700 registered voters want to bring back the Sonics versus 26% who don't seem to care. But that's a 31-point gap. That's a big gap. It's a big gap. That's a landslide. Yeah, it is a landslide. <laughs> and so it, it seems like, you know, it's so funny with politicians, too. They, it doesn't matter who the mayor or the council member is. It's really easy to bring back the Sonics. Or say, bring back the Sonics. <laughs> it's not so easy to bring back the Sonics. Right, right. Literally. Yes. And uh, one of the, the steps in all of this has been testing out Climate Pledge Arena, uh, now for the third year in a row to see if it is an MBA facility. The MBA has already said, Adam Silver has already said they are paying attention to this kind of thing. And and one of the people who's going to be involved in this Rain City Classic, this Rain City Showcase, you talk to. Yeah. Um, it, Kevin Calabro, we talked about him. He's just a great guy. I, you know him just as well. And he's just um, somebody that people that are nostalgic about the Sonics still think about good golly, Miss Molly, and yeah. all that great stuff. And now he's with the Trailblazers and, and we love listening to him there. Um, but of course he's he, like so many hoping the Sonics come back. And so we had a lot to catch up on, not just it'll be here this week, which is a part of it with the rain city showcase. I try really hard not to say that uh, title too quickly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 you know where I'm going with yeah. it. Um, but you know, uh. we did talk about what he's hearing around the league. Um, what he hears from players. You and I were talking to the Clippers and Jazz last year, and they were raving about Climate Pledge Arena. So it's one of those things that there's a lot to catch up on, as you'll see in this interview. With We talked about Kevin Martinez being a great guy. You could say the same thing about Kevin. He's loved by everybody, and I think you'll see why in this interview. Well, Kevin, first of all, we appreciate any time you have. Obviously, we just love any time we get to talk to you. And I know it's a busy time of year. Thanks for giving us a few minutes of your time here on Inside the Arena. It's my pleasure. Everybody uh, here in Portland is excited to come north to Seattle for Friday night's extravaganza. Oh, and that's what I want to start with here. I mean, uh, first of all, everybody here in Seattle, especially given kind of the context clues of what we hope comes down the line in the next couple of years with the Sonics. But even that aside, let's just focus on having an NBA game at that new arena, Climate Pledge Arena. I mean, how exciting is it for you to be there and how exciting of a game, even if it is preseason, are we going to be looking at? Well, you know, the Blazers were involved in the uh, inaugural event there uh, three years ago, and it was spectacular. Uh, I had had the occasion to be there for a hockey game before that, so I knew uh, just how interesting this building, how important this building uh, has been in, in Seattle, and just how um, state-of-the-art this building is, and what a wonderful job they have done in constructing it. But then to go actually go in there and then witness a basketball game, an NBA basketball game, because I had been to the hockey and also a WNBA game and a charity event there as well. Uh, but to see an NBA game uh, there was was certainly exciting. And so what a great opportunity to get back up there uh, on Friday night. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I know, you know, they've done this. This will be the third year of it. It's been the Blazers and the Clippers. We had the Jazz last year. So I know that's just three teams. I don't want to say it that way, but... Um, when the teams go in there, whether it's you all or whether it's your opponent, the Clippers, of course, Steve Ballmer's club, and what's kind of the reaction? I know I was able to talk to some of those guys, the players last year, and they're like, yeah, this is, this fits the bill. What's their reaction? You think when they see climate pledge arena? Well, you know, the, the players are so young, they just don't even remember the Sonics being in the NBA. A lot of them. I mean, they know of that certainly, 
somebody like uh, Jabari Walker, who plays for the Blazers, his dad, Samaki Walker, remembers playing the Sonics because he was an active player at that time. Uh, but they, you know, they quickly, I think, uh, then get a sense for what basketball uh, means to Seattle, what it meant to Seattle. When you go into the building and you see the the black and red of the Blazers, but you also see the green and gold of the Sonics everywhere. So uh, expect, as there there were two years ago when the, the Blazers played the Clippers, to see a lot of Sonic colors in there and a lot of Sonic fans, just NBA fans. They'll pack the place. They'll be very enthusiastic, and they'll be behind the Blazers for sure because it's the Northwest team. Absolutely they are. And I, I got to say, when I was a kid, I had Samaki Walker rookie cards. Now he's a, got a kid in the league. My goodness. Oh my. There you go. <laughs> I have to dig some of those up now, trying to keep them for my two-year-old son. You know, and I kind of mentioned the reaction to Climate Pledge Arena. And, you know, our Chris Daniels was at the meeting in New York last month. And the commissioner was like, oh, yeah, we pay attention to these games, these exhibition games, wherever they may be. But do you get the sense when there is a game like this at Climate Pledge, you know, you're almost maybe the league's gauging whether it's Portland, whether it's Utah last year, whether it's the Clippers, like, hey, what do you think about this city? What do you think about this venue? Do you, do you get the sense that that sort of thing happens? Or is it just kind of a given at this point that, yeah, this is a market that has always uh, been just, you know, crazy for basketball and things of that sort? Yeah, I think the the league certainly knows that. There are enough uh, old heads in the league that remember coming to Seattle, uh, going back, of course, to their departure in uh in 2008 gosh 16 years it's it's really it's it's hard to believe time has passed like that but i think they they have appreciate the 41 years of history that the Suns have had the the number of hall of famers uh that the sonics have had uh the appearances in the finals three appearances in the finals and a championship obviously in 1977 uh i think that the league also appreciates the presence of former sonics in the community and what they are still doing for the community i mean Everywhere you go, and there's a charity event. Detlef Shrimp, uh, Jack Sigma, Gary Payton, Sean Camp, uh, downtown Freddie Brown, the great Lenny Wilkins, uh, Slick Watts before his, his health issues. All these guys come back, and all of them lend a, a hand when it comes to these types of community events. And that's not lost on the league. They realize just uh, how ingrained the NBA culture uh, has been in Seattle and how it continues to be ingrained there. Oh, and I can't wait to see, uh, hopefully, Blazers Sonics games there once again in the near future. Before I, I get on to some Portland things here, I do want to talk about, you mentioned some of the legends there, and I know you're very active with the Sonics Legends Fund. i just like to, for folks who may be unfamiliar with what they do, we've certainly talked about it on this show before, but um, we know you lend your hand to what Sandy and that great organization is doing. Just how important is it to have something like the Sonics Legends Fund helping those stars that, you know what, we, we people hear NBA salaries today, they were not that uh, back in the 70s. And how critical is it to have that organization in our community? Well, uh, for the reason we just spoke of, to, to continue the legacy, uh, first and foremost, of, of the Sonics basketball in Seattle with the hope that obviously NBA basketball will return. Uh, but I think, moreover, uh, the the reason that we try to rally uh, together is to support those uh, folks in our Sonics fraternity and our Sonics family who have not done well in terms of health. Uh, to speak of the great Slick Watts and Gus Williams, who have had great health issues over the last several years, and to lend them a financial hand and then for a, a spiritual hand as well to reach out to them uh, Gus just celebrated a birthday. Uh, Sandy Gregory rallied everybody to send Gus a, a note of uh, congratulations on the birthday and wish him well and so forth. So those types of things are very, very important. Sandy does a, a great job of that and uh, does a, a masterful job of bringing everybody together as they will be on Friday night. Oh, I know. I can't. That's going to, you know, listen, I can't wait to see the game. But I think I'm equally excited to see pregame, whether it's you, whether it's some of those Sonics players we know will be there. I mean, it's going to be an awesome, awesome atmosphere, not just from the fans buzzing, which we know they'll be there, but almost the nostalgia of so many stars. I can't wait to see that, Kevin. Oh, Lenny will be there. You know, Lenny Wilkins, obviously. And I'm sure Jack, I'm sure Detlef, uh, unless they're out of the country, uh, will definitely be there. Probably see Gary Payton, Sean Kemp might be cruising by as well. Um, it, yeah, that it, it will be it will be spy a, quite a, a spectacle. And, you know, ties it all together, the Portland and Seattle aspect with him 
uh, becoming a player coach, playing in Portland and coaching the Portland Trailblazers, and then uh, coaching with the the Seattle SuperSonics back in the day. Uh, it's it's interesting the way those things go around. It really is, and I, it's just cool that it is the Blazers. Obviously, hey, anytime you get an NBA game here, we're going to be happy about it. But it's cool that yeah. the Blazers, because you've noticed the dynamic that. You know, there's a generation of kids. I mean, these are kids that are in high school yeah. now that have never seen an NBA team. So what do they do? They drive two hours down to see the Trailblazers. It's nice yeah. that they can just hop on the highway. That'll be a cool part of it too, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, we've we've got a number of uh, fans from uh, the state of Washington, from Seattle, that come down, or season ticket holders down here. And, you know, I appreciate them making the effort to come down here, as, as you mentioned, on the I-5. The I-5 series was always fun. It was very combative. Uh, the Henry Weinhard Cup, I remember, was always up for grabs. It was rekindled like as, uh, the, the the rivalry when George Carl arrived here and just kind of threw down the gauntlet. It's like the Blazers have have ruled the roost way too long now. And of course, the Blazers had those outstanding teams of the early '90s, went to the finals three times, and or uh, actually two or three years, and and, and were just uh, great, great basketball teams led by Clyde Drexler, the great Terry Porter who uh, up until a year ago was living here in the in the Portland area uh, and does a lot of our broadcasting as well. But, you know, I just remember um, the, the late, great Jerome Kersey matching up against Xavier McDaniel, those heated battles that those two used to have. It, it was just phenomenal. And uh, and the, the two cities lo really look forward to that. I know when the Sonics had some down years and the Blazers were up in the late, very late 80s, early 90s, uh, the Blazer fans, because there weren't enough Blazer tickets available to them when they were playing at the very, the smaller memorial here in Portland, uh, they would come up to Seattle to see the Sonics because they knew they'd get tickets because the Sonics at that time are playing sometimes spending part-time in the Kingdom. So there were plenty of seats available. So we did see a lot of black and red in the building at that time, uh, just you know, further fueling this, this fandom between the two cities. Oh, that's so cool. I appreciate that. Yeah, Kevin, I could keep you all day just asking stories about this. I, I love hearing this stuff. Um, you know, I got to tell you, I'll give you a quick story. I was doing, um, this is a couple of years ago now, they had me do a skit with Jimmy Kimmel. It was, we were at our own respective <laughs> green wall. So he was in his studio, but we could hear and talk to each other. And he's told me about it when he did radio back here in Seattle, back in the day. And they were playing. He was so excited to see. You just reminded me of this. He was so excited to see Xavier McDaniel, Jerome Kersey, square off, locking horns down low. And he's like, Nico, you know what I remember from that game? I'm like, what's that? He's like, I couldn't tell if that was sweat on Xavier McDaniel's forehead or if it was the old key arena roof leaking a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, that's and, what... and, it, and it did leak. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty key. That goes all the way back to the old Coliseum days. Yeah. So, Jimmy, you know, he's a true fan if he knows that bit of minutia about that building. Well, next time you watch him, that's his face. That, that was the first thing that came to his mind when he was like, oh, we got Nico from <laughs> Seattle. Hey, by the way. Yeah. So that was his anecdote. Uh, we talk about that, though. Pe folks here in Seattle that have kind of adopted the Blazers and whatnot. Um, what's really cool is you guys have this new TV deal and a number of those games with uh, K2 in Portland, which is our affiliate down that way. Yeah. Um, same ownership group. Um, a number of those games will be aired on C here in Seattle on Como Sister Station, KUNS Seattle CW. And I think it just kind of furthers that whole notion like, okay, you know, we have a lot of excited fans that people can sit on their couch and watch the Blazers. But it's one of those things, too, where um, obviously exciting for the Blazers to have this new TV deal, um, your perspective on that. But then the, the idea just by this partnership that those fans that have adopted the Blazers can, here in Seattle can watch them at home as well now. Yeah, you know, we obviously up there on Root Sports for a number of years, uh, but, but this is an opportunity now for everyone, everyone, uh, if you're a cord cutter, and there are a lot of them, uh, to get our broadcast. And that was the whole intent, is to open this up to as many people as possible. The cord cutters tend to be younger people, and we need to reach out to the younger people. Uh, and so that, I think, was the the, the biggest um uh, project that the that the Blazers had set out for them this summer was to the business side anyway was to get this thing over the air so that they can market it to a younger audience. They also have Blazer Vision, which is available to everybody, which takes things a, a, a step further because you can get a lot of ancillary programming pre post game. The the Trail, which is a tremendous documentary uh, type, well, a multi Emmy award winning documentary type inside. The Blazers inside a camp uh, feature uh, that is produced uh, quite often. 
And uh, those are the types of uh, components to uh, Blazer Vision that, that fans can expect for a, a very modest cost uh, per month. You can go anywhere in the United States, presumably anywhere in the world, you can follow Blazer basketball on your phone through the Blazer Vision, which is kind of cool. Different world these days, huh? Uh, hard to imagine. Oh, my goodness. You know, Kevin, I, I, I spent the last 10 minutes or so rapid firing questions for you because now I can do it in a podcast Zoom setting instead of trying to ambush you at a yeah. Sonics party where you're in demand. I just love being able to catch up with you. But as we do embark on this new year and we and we've seen the NBA just, oh, my God, take off by leaps and bounds. And, um, you know, how exciting is it? I mean, going into it, we can talk about the Blazers specifically, but really as the league gets bigger and bigger every year. Um, you've had a front row seat to see that growth and, and for decades now. Um, just how special is it to start this new year with all these new things going on? Yes, in Portland and across the Pacific Northwest, for that matter. Yeah, well, I've been doing NBA basketball since uh, I signed on with the Kansas City Kings back in 83, 84. So that, that tells you how the league has changed because they actually had NBA basketball in Kansas City up until their move in 85 to, to Sacramento, where they've been very successful in that market. Uh, Anecdotally, today at practice, I look out and I see close to 20 members of our staff, coaches, nutritionists, video editors, um, uh, training staff, all of them out on the floor. Uh, when I started uh, that year with the Kansas City Kings, Cotton Fitzsimmons was our head coach. Frank Hamlin was our assistant coach. And Billy Jones was our trainer. And that was it. And our trainer was responsible for not only, you know, doing the medical side of it. Now, there would be a team doctor available at home and both away. But the trainer essentially was doing all of that nutritional stuff, all the training stuff, getting players ready to go, monitoring them, that, that type of thing, as well as scheduling your travel, your plane, it, moving equipment and so forth. All that done by one man or maybe an assistant. Uh, somebody is hired out of high school to help him on a part-time basis. Uh, and that was amazing. One assistant coach for 12 guys traveling by commercial. If you can imagine that uh, all these seven footers jumping on an airplane, middle seats, all that knees, you know, early morning flights, the 5 AMs after playing the night before three games and three nights, uh, everything has uh, changed. And for the better uh, because we, we know now it's a, a multi-billion dollar uh, venture now, the NBA, without question, with the, you know, the in incredible TV contract, the, the number of ways we just mentioned that you can actually see an NBA game. Um, I mean, this was pre-league pass, pre-networks, everything. Uh, I remember being in Indianapolis, Indiana, for example, watching the, the 77 final uh, when the Sonics beat the Washington Bullets, the Washington Bullets then, um, and it was delayed on CBS after the local news. We couldn't get it until the 11.30, 11.30 after the 11 o'clock local news. You know, Brent Musburger, you know, broadcasting live uh, to tape. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it gives you just an idea how things have changed since the, you know, that, that, that time in the mid-80s when I joined the NBA to where they are now. Uh, you know, 40 years. Oh, I love it. I, I won't say that I was born in 85, but I just did. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, which isn't young anymore, unfortunately. I mean, it is, but it isn't. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, listen, I have one request that hopefully in a couple of years that the season opener is the Blazers and Sonics. Wouldn't that be something, huh? It would be it would be incredible. Uh, it, it, it truly would. You know, the Sonics coming on the scene in 67 and the Blazers coming on the scene shortly thereafter in 70, 71. And... Uh, just, just to look back on all those great battles and, and relive some of those, and uh, and then just to, to to rebuild the rivalry would would be outstanding. Yeah, no question about that. No, oh, I hope that. Yeah, it's that'll be a fun regional rivalry. A little bit, a little bit more uh, dislike if uh, with the Oklahoma City rivalry, if that develops. If, if well, again, you had that in, and it's just it, it's you know, and, and Oklahoma City is a team I heard on the Bill Simmons podcast yesterday, and, and I. I would have to agree. His feeling was that you're looking at an Oklahoma City team that uh, in the next five years could be in the finals three or four times and could win multiple championships. I mean, they're just that good. Oh, so, yes. So much you know, talent. From an overall look, from the the eight-mile view, looking down upon things, you know, you'd have to say that uh, the success of Oklahoma City is good for the league and with the Sonics 
possibly coming back to Seattle would obviously even better. But, uh, you, you know, I, I still I feel for the fans of Seattle for the 16 years they've had to wait for NBA basketball, you know, whatever it's going to be until they come back. You know, hopefully it's not going to be 20 years. Hopefully it'll be sooner than that. Uh, you know, we're certainly hearing that maybe it's the 27 season, maybe 28. So, uh, yeah, everybody's expectantly waiting for the Sonics. Yes, it's, it's, we hang on every word of Adam Silver at those press conferences. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, hey, he said they're going to address it this season, which means hopefully a few years down the line we get to see some basketball back here in Seattle. Yeah, summer. I think, you know, the, the TV contract now has been uh, has been decided and they've got that put to bed. And as he mentioned, what they need to do now is is go back to the owners. I think what they're waiting to see is ownership is waiting to see uh, where those numbers land in terms of the sale of the Boston Celtics. You've had the, the sale, uh, certainly of Phoenix. You've had the sale uh, of the Dallas Mavericks, of Charlotte. Uh, so they, I think they want to see where those numbers rest you know, when it comes to Boston and then get cost certainty on just how much they're going to share and what kind of uh, formula they're going to use a method they're going to use to possibly share television revenue in the first couple of years of that expansion because that TV deal is enormous and those owners really have got to consider that uh, carefully the uh, the amount of money that they're going to receive up front from two expansion teams which could be close to ten billion dollars combined you know uh, who knows maybe higher depending on the valuation of some of these teams and sales in the next. Uh, 12 months but uh that's the, the they've really they're considering that right now yeah that's one thing i always have to mention to folks out there like hey it's going to be soon we think but there's some really big decisions and that's why these expansion oh, yeah. processes take a little while um we appreciate that insight and kevin oh my goodness what just a joy to talk to you these last few minutes i really appreciate you covering some time out here as the regular season gets going soon thank you so much well thanks nico we'll look uh, forward to seeing you on friday and the rest of the fans that'll be great oh can't wait thank you Okay, man. Okay, I'm gonna give cool. it a clean second. Hey, really appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. No worries. My and pleasure. I, look for, I won't I won't talk your ear off Saturday, but I look do look forward to seeing you and saying hi. I can't wait for that. Yeah. Game. Yeah, I'll be there. I'm uh I think I'm gonna stop by and say hi to Sandy and her group. Nice. And uh and then head over uh courtside and kind of do the pregame thing. But yeah. yeah. Well that's I, the beauty of Como. We just walk over. It's it's pretty convenient. Oh, I know, yeah. Oh. It's fabulous. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, cracking old, games, all that good stuff. I, I you know, I love the building. I know parking, you know, it can be difficult, but uh, the building's just, it's terrific once you get in there. Oh, so beautiful. I was, yeah, it's just, yeah, state of the art. I, I remember when they first put it up, I, Todd by Wiki shows me the, uh, the NBA locker room they built, and I'm thinking it's like some big secret. I'm like, can you show me inside? Yeah. He's like, let me see if I have the key. He just opens it. <laughs> 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 oh, I love that whole crew over there. Yeah. Um, hey, yeah, uh, they're pretty really? dynamic. I I hope they uh I hope they get it. You know, I mean, they're gonna oh. they're gonna be some other bidders, I'm sure. But yeah, and weird. that's the thing. You know, we can be cautiously optimistic, but gosh, like you explained in the last question, there. I mean, there's so many variables that it's hard for a lot of people to grasp. You know, so yeah. But I think here's hoping. Well, I can't wait. I can't, especially can't wait to hear you on our games that we air on our station this year too, man. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Um, and even going back years, thanks for always being so kind to me and reach and answering emails, connecting me with folks. Never forget it. And I always appreciate it. Uh, no worries, man. My pleasure. All right. We'll, we'll see you see Friday, you sir. Thank I'll you. See you there Friday. Can't wait, man. Take care. All right, Nico. Take care. Bye. I feel like I just went on a magic carpet ride. There. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> Is he not the best? Like, come on. He's awesome. Oh, he's great. And just the, the institutional knowledge of the history of Seattle and the, and the Sonics. And he starts talking about X-Man and, rattling off every great that has ever played in this market. I'll, I'll tell you, the in a nutshell version of this story, as you know, is my career goal, dream to be doing sports here in Seattle. And it was Kevin that was answering my emails and giving me the words of encouragement and connecting me with folks. Uh, that is at least a good reason why I'm here today. So I, I am eternally grateful to him uh, as a person, in addition to that wealth of knowledge, awesome broadcaster that he is. Well, that shouldn't surprise anybody. And, you know, he he mentioned something there that that is worth pondering just about uh, the revenue sharing yeah. and and whether that factors into an expansion franchise, whether say Seattle and Vegas to name two cities uh, would have to forego something in order to get this deal done. There's a lot of numbers being crunched and, and that uh, appears to be why this process has been dragging out over the course of 
Now 19 weeks right. of well, inside the arena. And that's his thing. Like To his point, if you're saying, okay, Seattle and Vegas, hypothetically speaking, let's say you take 60% of whatever you print. That's still a lot of money, yeah. and they might be okay with it. I'm speculating, of course. Um, but there's a lot of big factors at play here to the average fan. It's like, well, I haven't heard about it yet. That's why. Well, we're going to be talking about it more in the weeks to come. We're going to be talking about it uh, at the Rain City Showcase, otherwise <laughs> known as the Rain City Classic. I just totally messed you up on that. You had no worries about it. I, I didn't have that. any problem with that at all, but uh, <laughs> we're going to be recapping all of that uh, next week. But over the last 19 weeks, boy, have we had uh, just a jam-packed list of guests. All of this downloadable. If you subscribe, you would have heard it by now. People like Kenny Main, Lenny Wilkins, who you just saw uh, Kevin Calabro mention. Uh, we've talked about the Secret Sonic stash in Seattle, the Fox Sports Network's former president, Bob Thompson, World Cup, Donald Watts. Boy, we've talked UW, WSU, all of this over the last 19 weeks. We're going into 20 now. That left in the glove, too. Oh, God. What a what a list of names and more to come on Inside the Arena, David Lee Pick. You've been listening to Inside the Arena with Nico and Chris. Please subscribe on your favorite platform. Until next time.